amazing the kind of opportunity you would find if you don't like man, like draft kids. kids. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I would have done different. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it is. Yeah. All right. Um, Mr. Nash, can you take roll? Here. Here. She's here. She's here. here. Sorry. I'm out of it. Okay. <laughs> I'm eating my cookie. <laughs> Mr. Harrow? Is there another chair? Here. Dr. Jermaine? Here. Dr. Kelly? Here. Mr. Kimes? Here. Mrs. Munter? Here. Mr. Nolan? Here. Mr. Nicholson? Yep. Mr. Rochelle? I'm here. 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 All right. Um, before we get started, two pieces of, of uh, just captive audience kind of information. So the Boosters Club has Christmas trees left, uh, and they're $75 each. They're absolutely uh, outstanding this year. They can be cut down if that tree is too big for you. And, and you just go online to the Boosters Club um, on Facebook, and um, <clears throat> you can figure out. It's right here in Newport that you can pick it up. So if anybody needs a Christmas tree, please consider. Also, they have wreaths left. And then the second thing is Pell is selling the uh, dinner books, which are uh, $20. And um, Pell gets part of that money. So if anybody's interested in those, let me know. They have some great restaurants here in Newport that are, you you know, buy one, get one meal free. And um, that's their before Christmas fundraiser. So uh, anybody else have anything they want to push? <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, Tom, Tom, Tom CTO has had the Christmas show. On Saturday night at... Uh, 5 p.m., Lynn Tungent, the city of Newport, worked with Rogers High School to get four trees for in front of Thompson. So the PTO is going to do hot cocoa, sing along, light the trees, put ornaments on, make it a whole community event. So it's open to everyone, not just Thompson students. It's a whole wide community event. And then you can go out to dinner at a restaurant on Broadway and support the economy after you have some cocoa and light a tree. Uh, and the rain date will be Sunday at 5 o'clock. So Saturday at 5, if it doesn't rain, if it rains, Sunday at 5. Okay. Um, all right. So to start the meeting, just to let you know, at the end of this meeting, um, as you heard, we sent an email out that we have a VE um, value engineering group that's going to try to get go through the information in depth and then be able to provide us some suggestions um, to the whole group. And they're going to be meeting right afterwards to get themselves organized. And I think the people on that are Pat, um, Brian, uh, I'm looking around the room just so I get it right. Uh, Dan, Dan's here, and um, Ray and Kendra. So I got Pat. He's the first one. So um, we're going to see how that group works out, and um, they will be um, coming back to us uh, in a few days with some suggestions. So, all right, that's all. Now I'll turn it over. Good evening. Joe DeSanti with Downs Construction. We're going to have Scott do an update on Pell first. Good evening, everyone. Welcome. So with regard to Pell, <clears throat> last time uh, we were here, we had approximately 20 items out on the uh, punch list. That's now reduced to uh, 13. Uh, we received an update from BN recently uh, regarding that. Um, with regarding the... Uh, uh, balance of those punch list items. Some of them are going to be addressed over the uh, Christmas holiday. There are a few items that are going to uh, linger out into January and February due to unavailability of some door slabs and, and uh, a couple of other items. So there will be some things that trickle over uh, the first of the year, um, and those will be coordinated uh, within January and February. But um, also, like I said, for uh, a number of the uh, punch list items, there's going to be uh, an effort uh, over the Christmas holiday, which will be arranged with the school. Um, with respect to the closeout, <clears throat> um, the um, care and maintenance information has been uh, turned over to the school at, at the very uh, basic uh, level. Um, there are a couple of things that need to be um, revised and uh, updated. 
Um, so with that, uh, we have some lighting O&Ms, uh, controls O&Ms, and uh, site, work, site work as built, and uh, irrigation O&Ms are still owed. So uh, those things will, will come in and will be um, added to that uh, complete submission and uh, will be reviewed by the design team and, and downs uh, and, and uh, brought to uh, closure. Um, with respect to the budget update for, for Pell, I mean, at this point, um, BN is billing down to approximately $20,000 left on the punch list item as retainage. Um, we anticipate a uh, plus uh, $300,000 surplus at the end of the job um, to be returned. So uh, that still holds true. And um, as, as uh, other things develop, we'll, uh, we'll uh, narrow that down. One of those things is the, uh, the prospect of adding uh, irrigation on the back of the school. Um, Rob Schultz, I believe, was away. Um, Jeremy from BN is going to uh, coordinate with him. Uh, now that he's returned and get a final disposition on, uh, on the position of the water meter and uh, the logistics of where we can put this uh, without creating problems with the uh, DPU. So that, that information is forthcoming and then uh, we'll have options on the table as to which way uh, we might want to go. Um, There really is no other action items here for Pell this evening. However, I will go over what's going on with the extended uh, bus loop change order and the uh, depression in the curb. Um, I met with Jeremy this afternoon and uh, for the information that he uh, sent forward to us and I sent forward to you, um, there is um, an issue with, with the depression at, at the curb continuing to settle. So they went in there, they cut the pavement, they went down there, they pulled it up. Um, but they believe there's some under drainage, some existing under drainage that needs to be tied in with the, uh, with the school downspout system and out to the storm, storm scepter. So soon they're going to uh, be paving at the apron where the uh, bus loop was extended. And they're going to temporary pave um, the portion in front of the curb their plan is to grind the edge of the curb down just to be flush um, and observe after this drainage tie-in. So at the same time, they'll be digging up the drainage in that spot and tying into the existing under drainage to try to alleviate the, uh, the under drainage problem, which they believe is, is causing the curb to settle. So that, that'll be an extended process. will probably not be resolved till the spring. So I just wanted to bring that to everybody's attention that that's how it's uh, planned to proceed. Anything else on Pell? So just to follow up on the closeout, typically when we do the closeout of the project, we get one book, one uh, multiple binders that the O&Ms that Scott referred to are o, uh, operation and maintenance manuals. But because the school is operational, we asked Bean to start getting as much of the information so that uh, the staff could have that information in hand. So they'll continue to supplement that binder with operations and uh, maintenance manuals. Um, and I think within the next month, I think from what Bean has told us, uh, they'll have all of those missing um, couple items that are there. So uh, the goal was, I know in the past when this project, the original school was done, there was some issues with getting the as-built documents and the warranties and the O&M manuals. And that's one of the things we strived to get done early on. And, you know, I think we're about 80% complete now from the documentation from BM, which is good. And we've asked for multiple copies. So there'll be a copy here, copy it. And also on a, on a thumb drive too. So we'll have multiple copies and we'll actually keep a copy in BM. So if you ever lose a piece or have a question, we'll be able to have access to it as well. So moving on to Rogers, um, before we get an update from um, Gilbane and Slam, I do want to talk about the value management log. Uh, it has been updated. One was distributed late last week. Um, I want everybody to understand what the process is like more than talking about the log. Um, we did filter the log out a little bit. We've added numbering there so that you can follow along. If you have questions, there's a line number you could ask or put some more narrative. Um, but tonight, it's less about what's really in the log than the, than the process. Um, you know, we're going to meet uh, uh, immediately after this meeting um, with the small group to start going through and vetting out that value management log. 
Um, and as I uh, discussed a couple of weeks ago, there needs to be some big picture discussions early on, um, you know, shelling, not shelling, eliminating those kind of discussions so that we could start looking at the bigger picture items and then start filtering our way down. It is a live log. It will change. Um, you know, once we start making some decisions and making recommendations, uh, we may ask uh, Gilbain to vet out those numbers a little bit more um, so that those numbers might change. They'll go up, they'll go down. Um, it's, it's, it's a process. And that's what I think I, I want everybody to understand is that process. We are not going to come to a decision in a matter of days or weeks. There's going to be some big picture decisions that are going to happen right away. Uh, cosmetology, automotive, and central office. What are we doing? Are we doing shelling? Are we eliminating? Are we recommending to just do the, the uh, foundations? Then, you know, over the next course of weeks, there, there's going to be other decisions that will be made. Uh, but I could certainly foresee this going on for months. Uh, there are certain items there in there like blinds and some certain other things that could wait months before we get a decision. Uh, but I just want everybody to know that not to walk away from here and know in two weeks we're going to have a full answer. Uh, Gilbane will continue to buy out the project as well, and we'll have real numbers at that point, which hopefully will help us. Uh, but all that stuff has to come into consideration. So I don't know if anybody had any other questions or comments on the value management process or the log that's out there right now. Um, go ahead. Oh, oh the mic. No. <laughs> I was wondering, um, while we're doing the value engineering, um, will we be considering other strategies to possibly get additional funding Think about alternative courses the district may want to take, i.e., I'm not saying do this, please, I'll repeat, I'm not saying do this, but if uh, programs we decide to eliminate, do we then decide to file another stage one application and um, go to bond for a smaller amount? Um, looking at the type of reimbursements, that's a very tight timeline. So um, I believe uh, February 15th, the application has to go in. September 23rd is when we have to have stage two, and then decision is in December of 2023. So there is still time to receive incentives, etc. I'm just, that's an example of other strategies to think about. And I will bring up the tab taboo word, regionalization, if people are thinking about possibly reconsidering that or coming back to the table. I could give you my opinion before anybody else on the committee. Um, I've had ongoing conversations with Ride and individuals at the state. Stage one is absolutely an option for uh, cosmetology and automotive because it was not and it is not included in our stage two right now. Um, so they would entertain if we would like to submit a stage two for those programs. Um, and maybe it's the backup plan and you submit it anyways. Um, I think that even though it is a tight deadline to get it done by February. I think if you asked us to do it, I think we could pull together a stage one. Yeah, we have most of the information. Um, we submitted a stage one backup last year too, just in case, and then withdrew it. Um, so if that is, that is certainly an option um, and may want to be considered, uh, but we could pull that off and get that done as well. Would uh, central office be considered as well? You just brought up the two programs. I, I brought up those two because those are the two that I know for a fact. I think central office we could make an argument for because we did switch off central. It, central office is in the stage two, but we did switch it off for some of the art rooms initially. So we could make that argument that we did switch off other programming for it. Joseph, Dr. Jermaine brings up a good point about the budget rather than just looking at ways to reduce the cost. Do we really understand or have a strategy to increase the available budget? So we talked about some couple hundred thousand dollars left over from Pell. Does that get shifted over into this budget at some point in time? And when is that? Because some of the painful cuts here are fifty and sixty thousand dollar items. So you could buy back a few things by shifting that small amount of money. Um, I'm probably in a bad seat to say this, but the school department has a five and a half million dollar unrestricted budget surplus. They could probably strategize how that would become capital improvement funds and get reimbursement from the state and buy down some big items in here, like shell outs or athletic fields or other things. So I think there's a few options around that. We might be able to, ahead of the bond, actually increase some of the available funds. You're, you're absolutely correct. Um, so we were just having 
conversation about FF Lee, but before I go there, that, when you reminded me about the field, I did have a conversation about the field as well with Ride, and they said, yeah, they would consider that as well as part of the stage too. So the big, those big items, uh, they certainly would, would take it in consideration. Uh, but we were just having a conversation previously with uh, SLAM um, talking about FF and E in the budget, right? And coming up with the estimate is, um, and one of the things that I said is that we're going to add at the bottom of the VM log, we're going to put a subsection that says FF and E on there because we're, there might be some savings or some thoughts on how we could move some of that around. And one of the things that I threw out there was, well, maybe we could buy some of these monitors like you see up here this year through some other budget and then next year and not utilize all those FF and E dollars there. Um, technology a little bit tougher just because there's a lot to do with technology and security and everything. But I think on the FF and E side, there's, there might be some savings. One other question, if I could, um, on the budget. From the budget sheet that we provide, I can't tell where the inflation escalation is built into the program. Can you tell us where it's built in and what the rate of inflation assumption is at this point? Yeah, I think Gilbane would be better off to answer that question okay. than the estimate. Yeah. Um, so in some cases, it's built in, in. In our budget, it's just part of the number. And I, I see that what you're looking at our control yeah, budget right now. Yeah, that's a control budget. The estimate would have um, the escalation contingency in there, uh, which I think was 3.9, if I remember correctly. Um, and then there might be some other uh, costs within the line items that they have in there as well. So I, I think that that would be a question that I would ask um, Gilbane's pre-construction um, estimator to give us that. Yeah, I'm just hoping we're not going to make the same mistake twice and assume 2% inflation when the construction industry knows it's 14%. Yeah, no, no, no. We, we, I think we have it covered to the best of our ability right now. I mean, we won't know until the day you buy it, but I, we're certainly not assuming 2%, um, but we're not assuming 30% either, yep. right? So, and one of the things that we saw early on, and I'm not saying it was in, in this estimate, but other estimates is that estimators got scared and they were putting escalation and contingencies on, and then they were putting escalation <laughs> on that. So it was almost double counting it. Um, and, you know, and then everybody looked great at the end when they bought the project and it came under budget, but, uh, it also means that now you're going to go back and start adding stuff into the project, right? So sometimes, you know, it's difficult to add stuff. It's difficult to take stuff out. Um, but it, it certainly is something that we're keeping an eye on. Uh, another strategy I think we need to look at is um, operational saves for our operating budget. We want to keep that as low as possible. So some of the deltas that you see that are in the tens of thousands, I think that's something to to itemize and then be able to come back and ask the school committee whether they'd be willing to take some of that surplus to reduce operating budget in the long term. So I think that's a strategy well, to consider. That's actually a very good point, Ms. Bo, right? So I, I was just in a VE meeting today on another project. And this is, like I said, this is not unique to Newport. It's something we deal with every day. And one of the things they want to do is go to VCT, like this floor. And I said, absolutely not. We'll find the money in the district because the amount of time and money it costs to maintain this floor over a period of 10 years, it, the buyback on it is just find the money and we'll find the surplus to put that in there. So those are the kind of things that we want to be aware of and make the right decisions. We don't want to, you know, I don't want to say, I, I guess, you know, make the building where we're, we're coming in at less cost, but over a long period of time, the operational cost is significant. Correct. And there's several things on there that need to be identified that way, including, as we saw at East Providence, the tile on the walls, because they were refinishing all their walls in the bathroom as well as in the hallway. And then our water bills are very high. So, you know, we have to do those kinds of things to reduce costs as well as the flooring and so on. Thank you. Just on that floor, I mean, is all um, well, the principals will know is the custodian spend the whole summer getting the floors ready, more than one. So that's a lot of savings, you know, um, if we don't have to, you know, just mop floors and not have to wax them and strip them. And yep. yep, and the same thing with the wall tile. If this wall tile wasn't in here, you'd be painting it every single year, right? And that's a cost. So those are the kind of things that, although, you know, we, we don't want to be, was it penny wise and pound foolish, the old saying, right? So we want to be very aware of what decisions we're making because the long-term cost of those might be offset 10 times at this point. Any other questions? 
All right. At this point, I'm going to hand it over to Alita if you want to give an update on construction. Alita, one of the questions that has come up is that um, what have we procured and what is out there to procure as well? And just the timeline. Notes, but um, know what they are. Uh, so we can start out with procurement. We got bids in for your roofing package a couple of days ago. We're going to have scope reviews for roofing uh, tomorrow. I think both of them are scheduled for tomorrow. The roofing release was driven again by lead time for the materials. You're over six months for a roof insulation, so we needed to get through the process so that we can get that released. Um, kind of supporting the overall construction schedule. Spray fireproofing scope reviews went, um, took place last week and those best and final numbers are due at the end of this week. And the steel, structural steel best and final numbers came in at the end of last week. And we're betting those right now. We're, um, we're weighing cost and um, delivery dates. We're having the feedback on when the steel is available kind of fluctuates by bidder. So that's what we're doing over these next couple of days to try to get it locked in. And um, the anticipation is we were always targeting uh, the building committee meeting on the 12th. I realize this one moved from last week, but um, we were always targeting the meeting on the 12th to be able to send a recommendation for structural steel. And we should still be on track for that. And as an added bonus, we may have the spray fireproofing. We likely won't have roofing um, finalized by, what is it, Thursday morning for backup, Wednesday. So. Um, we're hoping to get two in your hands. Uh, so that's the procurement side. The next round of packages will be driven by the next uh, set of documents. I think we're all kind of caught up with everything we have. Um, progress and schedule-wise, the, uh, the bus loop is complete per the existing plans. There's some modifications that need to happen. We're trying to get those on track to happen in the next week or two so that we can turn the bus loop over. In the meantime, what we are trying to do is continue on with what we can on, I call it our side of the fence, right? At some point, there's going to be a defined line where our side of the fence is the current West parking lot and auditorium side, and then the other side is the existing campus. So we're going to try to proceed with the work on, quote unquote, our side of the fence by establishing that fence line, there'll be some coordination with uh, the school and operations because we're we're trying to do it while you guys still have that side of the bus loop. But again, should be simple enough. A lot of perimeter fencing we've started. If you um, were to look out there, the fencing around the field, I was going to say football field, but I'm not sure if it's a football field, right? So fencing around the field is pretty well complete. That's where we're going to stockpile all the soils that we excavate from the building foundation. And we've started coming up from there, up toward the main road. We will fence in the west parking lot and get down to the Wickham Road side and make that line straight along the existing main entrance. Um, and no next week in earnest, we want to get started digging for foundations. So that'll be the real work. The um, demolition, as you see, the building is mostly down. A couple little corridors and things that are still standing. Finishing up that temp wall at the end of the gym. And then we'll be starting the ripping out the foundations, which is the underground portion of the existing auditorium. So that starts coming out, and that allows us to start digging for the new foundations, like I said, next week in earnest. So that's schedule on Rogers. Questions? <coughs> Yeah, I had a question. Um, when by you know cutting off the corridor, is that going to affect the heat in the gym? No, it shouldn't. The make safe they kind of delineate the lines that we cut and we cut and capped them and kept its own okay. services separate to that side. Can you um, tell us a little bit about those additions or alterations to the the new the temp bus loop that you're talking about? That's going to cause a little delay in in the transition of possession. The mic. Oh. Uh, can you explain a little bit about the the additions or, or alterations to the bus loop, the temp bus loop that yeah. you had mentioned? What we're doing is making it wider by about six feet right now as designed. The, the buses could pass each other, but it's tight. It doesn't really work logistically for how they get there in the morning, line up, move students on and off. It's kind of, it, it's just too tight for everyday operation for the next two years. So um, we got a sketch where we're going to widen that a bit, move over the Jersey barriers to create that walkway for the students and just give more, more functional space to the drivers for, for doing it, you know, doing the business of lining up the buses and getting the kids on it all okay and what's the or is there an additional cost to that and if so why was that not thought about when we designed it i just want to know what the cost impact is for having to do more and then of course 
causing this delay in, in transitioning it over to, to use? Um, there is a cost impact. We're waiting on pricing. We, um, I mean, I can't speak to why it wasn't thought of when it was designed. We kind of um, just working from the plants. Um, we're, we're trying to minimize that cost and the schedule impact. We have a couple options on the table. Asphalt, as you know, plants will be closing soon. So um, that's really the that's the driver. If we can get them in there, if we can get a commitment from an asphalt plant by the end of next week, I think we're in pretty good shape. Otherwise, we're looking for a temporary measure for the temporary space <laughs> so that we can still get the buses what they need for function and then if the asphalt gets pushed beyond the first of the year then it would be you know something to deal with thank you a, a process question on the bid packages probably two part um one is when you award how long uh is it valid for is the bidder held uh, to deliver. And the second one is when you do award a bid, do you go back to the construction document cost estimates and fill in the actual so we're not using estimates any longer? Yeah, so we, um, we we have developed a tracking sheet. I mean, um, Joe looked at it. We have, it's our comparison, right? We have the, the estimate line items and as the bids come in, we're comparing it to it to show nets over under savings. Yep. So we are um, tracking that as, they, as they're finalized, right? And that's not necessarily when they come in because there's the vetting process and the revi revision of the bids. So, um, and they vary, like all of the bids come in and they have some, you know, we'll hold our price for two weeks type of language up there. Mm -hmm. but when we go through the scope review process, we're tracking, we're conscious of your committee schedule and approval cycle so that we request when they come back with their best and final that that number is held until, like for instance, we told the steel contractors that they need to hold it until December 15th, knowing that the meeting would be on the 12th and give us the time to get through the process of the award to support that number. They originally wanted to hold it until, I want to say, December 1st or November 15th. Yeah, I'm probably most interested in locking in costs so we know yep. where we are. Any other questions, comments? Well, thank you. Sitting right over there if you need me. Mm -hmm. So just to follow up on that question about the cost, um, as we were reconciled the 60% CD estimate, uh, proposals were coming in, bids were coming in, and part of that reconciliation is Gilbane and Slam Mayakota, uh, their estimator, changed those numbers to plug in the numbers that were going to be the RTAs, the recommendation to awards for those. So, but now at this point, there won't be any other estimates. What we will do, though, is, as Alita had uh, stated, there's a tracking log that shows what the estimate number is, what the actual will be, and then there'll be a variance as to up or down or whatever that might be. Uh, I don't believe there's an update from SLAM today. I think they've been working and supporting us in the background with the anything that we need. Um, I think the next item we do have is an action item, though, for the owner-provided special inspection and third-party testing recommendations. And Scott, I believe you have the backup. Hello again. <clears throat> with regard to the... Uh, uh, recommendation for uh, uh, special inspections and third-party testing. Special inspections, I believe, were added to the International Building Code in 1988 um, in response to some nationwide structural failures um, in the late 70s and the early 80s. Uh, a task force was put together by the federal government. Uh, I think it was uh, initiated by Al Gore, actually. And uh, in the end, by 1988, uh, special inspections were added to the International Building Code as a requirement. Uh, it's, it's, it's all about safety. Um, so it is a owner uh, provided um, requirement um, for the lack of uh, um, conflict of interest, we'll put it that way. You know, so, so there's, a, there's a, an overseeing um, inspection entity um, throughout the process um, with, with regard to structural elements. So with the backup that was provided, um, we put together a memorandum um, for not only the special inspector uh, coordinator, uh, which is uh, the first requirement. Now we looked at um, O'Day as the engineer of record, and we also looked at Briggs. Um, the proposal for um, O'Day was included 
um, as well as Briggs. Um, Briggs was essentially close to half the price. Um, if we do consider O'Day, I mean, we're, we're essentially in some ways paying a premium. So, uh, you know, in the interest of, of saving the, the dollar, which is important uh, on this project and others, um, we recommended that uh, Briggs uh, take on the responsibility of special in inspections coordinator. And at the same time, we reached out to five third party uh, materials testing agencies, um, did a little spreadsheet to compare them side by side and qualifications. And uh, Briggs again uh, came out on top uh, with respect to that. There is another element um, within the uh, special inspections, which is the geotechnical portion. Um, we had PAR um, go ahead and give us a proposal on, uh, on site observations. Um, there's a little caveat to that, where um, that particular observation is required to be done by an engineer or an engineer in training. Uh, Briggs, for example, has geotechnical uh, technicians, but they do not have the, the engineer's capacity. So for that reason, um, we recommended that, that PAR um, be on site to observe all the uh, um, basic um, soils observations for the, uh, the in situ soils, meaning the soils in place, getting down to an acceptable level, um, having um, the engineer uh, review the soils as they are taken out and uh, get us to an acceptable level where we can start building back up with uh, imported materials. Um, PAR in this case would be doing their own compaction testing. Um, there's also, um, as we get into <coughs> the, the nooks and crannies of, of this particular letter, um, if you can scroll a little bit down. So on the overall recommendation, um, I came up with a, a we came up with an estimated order of uh, magnitude inclusive of all special inspection activities at approximately 321,000. That includes um, the special inspector coordinator, that includes PARS costs, that includes third parties inspection. I do have a, a, a clarification and an update to that since we've had uh, a meeting with uh, Gilbane and Park to go over the, the forward requirements of the, the geotech, and there's going to be some some cost sharing um, within the uh, bid packages, and um, by virtue of, of PAR doing their own compaction readings as they go, um, we're going to be able to to uh, take some of this uh, these dollars and cents off the balance sheet. And Kathy, maybe if we can get to the estimate for third party testing. Scrolling through the uh, all the that were put in for comparison. We'll get back to the particulars of that maybe. In this particular spreadsheet right here, um, <clears throat> under the soils portion, the compactions, the sieve analysis, which means the gradations, they have to take samples of the soil in order to uh, come up with a proctor, which is a mathematical you know, equation to. Um, basically uh, assess the um, testing density of, of the soils. They have a number to go by. So these particular um, elements, these two, um, many of these uh, things will be taken care of within the PAR, geotechnical. And as far as the sieve analysis, within the Gilbane bid packages, uh, the import material will have a sieve and a proctor um, submitted uh, with their environmental um, data. So um, from, from a cost sharing perspective, I'm taking um, this portion out and, and saying that it will be shared between uh, the, the PAR scope overlap and the, uh, the Gilbane uh, bid package uh, inclusions. And then with respect to uh, the number of traveling occurrences, if we can go down a little bit further. Fortunately, there were some 
travel related um, expenses. So 22% uh, of the uh, occurrences is also reduced for a net uh, total exposure of approximately 281,330. Not to say that we won't be spending close to 321 because of the inclusions within the bid packages, you know, it's, it's being paid for in one way or another. We but with, with respect to what we're looking to approve and add at this point, we're recommending Briggs as the special inspections coordinator, uh, Briggs as the third party testing, materials testing and, and testing agency, and PAR as the geotechnical engineer of record uh, for all the base soil observations. And that would be for the foundations and, and slabs and, and other surface bearing um, criteria. I have a question on that. So I noticed that it was 80 half days or f would be 40 uh, days that PAR has and they're charging $400 a day. If they can't get it done in that time, do we get charged more or is that something that they have to eat? Yeah, so go ahead. The answer is we would get charged more. So this is Cost an estimate of what the inspections might be. Um, so that, it, it, and as Scott pointed out, this is federally mandated. This is something we have to do to protect us and the project. Um, so you have to go out and hire these engineers to oversee the quality and, and test, physically test some of the materials that are on there. You know, this is a, a fairly complicated document. And if you look at some of the backup to it, Actually, if you go back a little bit, Kathy, you'll see, you know, all of these individuals have to be certified or professional engineers or geotech engineers. So these are certified individuals or engineers that have to go in there and do the actual testing. They charge us by the hour, uh, by travel time. Um, the one thing I will say is if we have to go back and retest for some reason, if something fails because the subcontractor didn't do anything right, we would not want to pay for that. We would back charge that contractor. But those are extreme cases that that happens. But for the most part, they're here. They give us our best guess on how many times they have to come out here based on the schedule, based on the documents, based on their experience. Um, but I think even here at Pell, we, we ended up having, we found some additional soils, if you remember, and we ended up paying a little bit more for our prof professional engineer, or geotech engineers to come back and test the soils to see if we could reuse it. Joe, from a budget perspective, the control budget, where are these professional services carried? Because I don't see a lot of money left in uncommitted balance. Yeah, they're in the top portion under professional services. Mm -hmm. And I think we have we targeted a little over 300000 for that, if I remember correctly. So it would already be in committed encumbered? Uh, yeah, we probably put it under encumbered already, yes. Okay. Yeah. Right. Thank you, Joe. So, yeah, as Joe mentioned, it is a, at least with the third party testing, it is a by fee occurrence um, for each venue. Um, so with that, um, this estimate for third party testing sheet that was just up on the screen, um, we actually reached out to SLAM in collaboration with them. We came up with an estimated number of uh, inspection occurrences, so we could put you know an order of magnitude to this. So that's that's basically where that came from. So um, you know, with respect to the, the details of each of the proposals, you know, it is part of the backup. I'd be happy to go over any of these with you if you feel it's necessary. Or um, as Joe mentioned, it's just a it's a it's federally mandated and it is a requirement. And uh, we did our due diligence to uh, bring in some proposals and and get to the most uh, cost-effective and uh, qualified position with respect to special inspections and third-party testing. I'd like to move forward the motion on the recommendation by Downs for the third-party testing. I'm sorry, I had one more question. Oh, I thought you were sorry. asking a question. <laughs> um, so this is budgeted. Yeah, thank you. Say again? This is budgeted. We have it in the procured. Yes. Yeah. Joe just Thank you. Where, I just yes. needed that clarification no, for everyone. Thank you. Yeah. Yep. Is there any more discussion or questions? Okay. Now I'll make a motion to move this forward to a vote. Second. It's been moved and forwarded to move the recommendation that uh, was up on the board a second ago. 
to uh, to vote on it. Is there any any other discussion or questions? All right, all those in favor, raise your hand. All those opposed, passed unanimously. Very good, thank you. Okay, that concludes our update. Unless anybody has any specific questions. I would just say if anybody has any ideas to, you know, we just heard one from Louisa and from Colleen about the, you know, value management or value engineering, um, that they make sure they talk to someone so it can be like considered. I mean, it obviously can be considered later, but just to throw it on the table now would be good. So, because uh, it takes many heads to figure this out. The only comment I'm going to make is I really do think a group should get together to form strategy yeah. on how we're going to approach this and what different venues we could possibly tap and or, you know, come from different directions, but try to exhaust as many of them as possible um, all the way to additional grants, additional seeking funds um, from public, private, different organizations. I know there's... Um, Louisa, uh, we were back and forth this morning, something on energy. There's a big energy uh, grant coming forward, thinking about, but that's not, but this is not something the school department could um, um, apply for, but the city could, um, as far as it's almost like going for a loan. And um, if you can take all the energy saving uh, costs we have in our present project, and throw it over to that loan and then somehow work something out. But that's a that's a bigger thing. And, and I'm not saying, I'm not rec making recommendations. I'm just thinking of all the different options there are. Again, going back to the taboo word regionalization for some, uh, middle school, that's something, you know, high school people weren't too in favor, but, you know, listen, Thompson Middle School is small and Middletown needs a new middle school. And then we want all high school students to have as many choices as possible. You know, maybe something could be worked out that way. I don't know. Um, but I, I do think we do need to look at, and we have, it's just so everyone does know, the school department has, and with the finance subcommittee, we have talked about if we have to tap some of our um, fund balance, possibly, you know, we all need to do our part. So we are looking at all different options. Okay, anybody else with anything they want to add? Oh, Santa Claus, too. We like Santa Claus, so if there is a Santa out there, Isn't yes, you come see us. Christmas miracle. Yeah. Lottery. <laughs> all, right. Um, all right, so if there's nothing else, I will leave uh, the VEM group here, and they'll get started in a few minutes, but there's uh, more refreshments in the back for uh, you to take them home, so little baggies. A motion to adjourn. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 No one's opposed. Aye. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, very much so. Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, I 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 Ye